So I'm very happy to introduce today's speaker, Andrei Gromov. Um, Andrei, that he's undergraduate in uh, St. Petersburg, on uh, Russia. And then he uh, received his PhD from Stony Brook in 2015 uh, under Sasha Banov. And then we are very lucky to have, have had him here for three years as a Karanov Fellow from 2015 to 2018. And then Andre moved to Berkeley for a year and then became a faculty member at um, Brown, uh, where he stayed until last year. Uh, and now he's moving to uh, to University of Maryland by way of uh, Meta AI. Uh, so uh, Andre uh, has been uh, working on many interesting problems with condensed matter physics, including um, uh, fractional quantum Hall effect, um, fractons, synthetic photons. Uh, but today is going to tell us about a solvable model of future learning. Please, Andre. Thank you, Son, for detailed introduction. Uh, I'm really happy to be here. Uh, I actually gave the very first kind of seminar when this room was just opened. I was the, uh, the, the postdoc responsible for it, so I just put myself as the very first speaker. <laughs> um, looks exactly the same still. Okay, so um, since I understand it's not exactly a mainstream physics topic, I am going to try to make this more of an entertaining uh, talk. It's something I have been thinking about for the last year and a half and uh, sort of completely consumed my conscious and unconscious intellectual life. So it's so because I find important and interesting, but uh, okay if you want. Um, okay. So as I promised, I will mostly spend time on introduction and uh, on maybe some entertaining things that are not known, maybe even in the community who mostly works on this. So uh, the subject would be neural networks, deep learning, and um, in early days, this was called artificial intelligence. And I wanna start with this um, report by Rand Corporation. For those of you who don't know what Rand Corporation is, some defense you know, DOD organization that existed forever. Um, this report was done in 1965. If you don't know, to look for it, I think it's impossible to find, it's buried on their site. But if you do know what to look for, you actually can find it, as I did. And the, there are two interesting things about it. We'll discuss both. First is the title. Um, the author spends 100 pages comparing uh, the state of AI in 1965 with alchemy. And in particular, he uh, says that the proper comparison to alchemy is that the reason Alchemists failed to transmute gold and um, uh, from other metals because they didn't know nuclear physics, they didn't have better understanding of the world to be able to accomplish the goals that they want to accomplish. And he was trying to make a case that uh, the same situation is in AI. People promised a lot in 1965, but they didn't understand enough. Um, curiously, the same uh, metaphor, the same formulation was rediscovered. 52 years later by different people who, to the best of my knowledge, never heard about this report. They use exactly the same words, arguing exactly the same points. Interesting there, this came up after huge progress we have seen since 2012. And uh, this is not some just um, fringe articles. There was a conference in IAS by you know, with real scientists spent a week arguing whether AI is alchemy of science. You can watch all of these arguments on YouTube. They're very entertaining. Um, so for some reason this uh, parallel persisted since the inception of the field up until the present day. But I want to go back um, to, to the report because I find it absolutely fascinating. And since I'm trying to do more of an entertaining talk, I'll, I'll just read it parts of it with you. So the author um, comes to the conclusions that um, the reason AI is not working in 1965, uh, there are four reasons, and he lists them. So the first reason is that uh, AI is trying to recognize the patterns, but in the real world, patterns are usually distorted in various ways, 
And because of this computer that just has a list of rules, it's, it's failing to do well. Okay. And uh, this problem has now been mostly solved. Um, but it is a real problem. He identified it correctly. Yeah? He also points out that if you want to solve a real world problem, the connections between various things in the real world are really complicated. You cannot enumerate them. And even if you could, you will end up in a situation like a space of states of chess and go or, or go that you cannot consider all possibilities because they're too numerous. Uh, this problem is also has been solved since then because nowadays we use neural networks that do a lot of these things, a lot of this uh, searches and computations in parallel. He also points out that answers to certain questions that come from the real world often depend on context. I'll make a joke about the context in a second. Uh, <laughs> let's set that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, context has been, the issue of context has been partly solved by something that's called attention mechanism. And um, um, he also says that some traits are very complicated, are so complex, we may not be able to even list them as the rules. They are maybe not human understandable or human explainable. And this could also be solved by something that's called feature learning, which is what I will spend most of the time talking about. But then I want to flash this term first. Now, coming back to the context, although it's partly solved, um, uh, we still have issues like this. When you ask a diffusion model to draw salmon in the water, in the river, it, it can do this. <laughs> so um, to be completely fair, the new versions no longer do that. So maybe there was some sort of good fix to this. But this is an example of uh, even the modern systems don't fully understand, not fully understanding the context. So having established the difficulties, um, he says that you know the systems will work better if one of this, uh, if, if all of these four things are implemented. I just want to remind you, it's 1965. Okay. So uh, first, he says that you know computer will behave intelligently if you can distinguish essential and essential features. We, you and I, can, but computer cannot. And this is also solved by uh, feature learning, which uh, is the subject of the talk. Um, then he uses this fringe term, fringe of consciousness. And he basically says that, well, when a human plays chess, human kind of feels what's right and what's wrong, whereas computer doesn't have this mechanism, computer just goes through all, the, through all possible rules. Nowadays, computer plays uh, chess or any other discrete state or information game better than any human could ever do. And because and that happens, not because there's so much compute power we can go through all possibilities, it's because now there is a version of computer feeling what's right as well. And that's done using Monte Carlo research. Uh, account, uh, uh, so the context is um, partly solved, uh, despite uh, the example I gave you using this tension mechanism about which I won't talk about, but you can Google it. There are, there's a certain amount of information about how this works. Now, number four, for the life of me, I don't understand what he means. Uh, he's dead, so we cannot find out. But uh, perhaps that's the understanding what he means by number four is the, the final remaining breakthrough that will give us something more intelligent. I don't know. Um, he finishes this, his, um, one of his sections with very nice uh, statement, which I, again, in 1965, it feels almost prophetic. So he says that it's not surprising, but all the more discouraging that further progress in game playing, problem solving, and language translation, which is the problems people are working on now and achieving incredible success in now, uh, awaits a breakthrough in pattern recognition research. So this progress, this breakthrough has happened, although it didn't happen as a single explosion, like usually happens with uh, breakthroughs. I slowly crept up, but if I were to choose a day, or maybe a year when it happened, the year is 2012. That's what progress, this breakthrough looks like. So, sorry. Yes. This is Hubert Dreyfus, the author of that. Um, this is the only information I can give you about him. His name, <laughs> and in 1965, he was uh, an expert of some sort in rent preparation. Uh -huh. She was in Santa Monica, I guess. He didn't disappear after this. <laughs> uh, no, I don't know. It's a good question. 
<laughs> Fortunately, I ran out of time making slides. So <laughs> if I had more time today, I would have Googled it and maybe would have had answer to the question. I don't think he became an AI. Yeah. Okay, so but that's the pro that's what uh, progress looks like. Um, not progress, the breakthrough looks like in a single year. So this is a result of a image recognition competition. Image recognition is like the most basic example of a pattern recognition task. You have an image, you want to be able to say what's on it. In 2012, these are all of the participants, or at least the participants that did the best. On the vertical axis, the error rate, meaning how uh, what fraction of the images they got wrong. And all of them perform you know, roughly the same, except one single entry uh, that did 10% better. That's a progress of 10% in one year, whereas before it was half percent, one percent per year. Um, what is all these models have in common, or all these methods have in common, they didn't do as well, is that they followed the 1965 philosophy, they designed certain rules by hands. The rules became increasingly more complicated every year, but they always designed them by hands. And then we'll, we'll go into more formal details what it means throughout the talk. Whereas uh, the uh, method that performed well did not design the rule by hands. Instead, this method um, at its foundation had the idea that the rules themselves need to be learned by looking at the images. So instead, there are no rules, there are just images, and you spend as much um, energy as you have available and as much computers you have available to distill the patterns directly from the images. You don't put anything by hand. You, you put as little as possible by hand. So these guys use neural networks to do this, and virtual neural networks. Now, you may say, well, 10% is maybe not that big, but that's what happened since, up to 2017, and from 16% error rate to 2% error rate. And uh, as of 2021, that's the current leader. It has less than 1% error rate. And I don't know, maybe, maybe it will get better, even better over time. What's the error rate for a human? So this is the interesting point. Um, because at some point, it's hard to define when, when, the, when accuracy is so high, it's hard to define uh, whether the computer is right because an individual human doesn't do as well. So, it is believed that individual humans should do 96, 97. However, if you put a lot of very smart people together, like in the audience, they can do better than 96, 97, hopefully, and can make a more objective measure that would give us confidence that it is indeed 99%. In the end of the day, the labels are not determined by the laws of nature. The labels, what's on the images is what we all agree on. So, if you take this perspective, then human performance is 100% by definition. <laughs> when I say it is, it is. Sorry, but photos of cats are just objectively photos of cats, but it's not. Uh, <laughs> no? Uh, that's really. Eh? There are um, various. Um, so the counterexample of this would be various uh, illusion images. When you look at it long enough, it looks like a cat, but when you look at it even longer, it looks like, a, I don't know, a cup or a donut. So classifying something like this, we, you and I may disagree, depending on which one of us has been looking longer. There are always such cases that you can find. So, but that's uh, kind of mm, zeroes in on the point that whenever there is a, a real world task that doesn't have, that's not coming from science, then there is a degree of uncertainty. We, all, we have to agree on something. Okay, so given this um, first uh, entertaining introduction, I'll, I'll have a little bit more entertainment later on. Uh, here's the plan. So I will I try to explain what deep learning and feature learning are. And then if I have time, I'll get to the topic of this talk, which is a, an effect called groking. Should I explain what it is? And uh, I'll explain how, what it has to do with deep learning and with feature learning. And uh, I made up a model where you can understand what feature learning and uh, what drawing is analytically by writing equations rather than sort of having a conversation. 
Uh, Rocky means something in English. Oh, yeah. If, you, if you'd like me to explain, Rocky will be here. Uh, okay. okay. So uh, it's uh, colloquially nowadays, it means sudden, deep understanding. You know, for example, you asked me a question, I grokked what you were asking me. Uh, but originally, it comes from a sci fi uh, story called Stranger in a Strange Land. And you can view the entire book as definition of the word. So, you know, it will take a while to truly really define it. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay. And the, the content of the scientific part of the talk is in this archive. By the way, feel free to interrupt me because I'll usually stare here or there and I won't notice that. Okay, so let's start from the very beginning. Suppose you're doing physics lab and you measure a bunch of points. Um, and you see a picture like this. Uh, what would you do to find the functional relation between the x-axis and y-axis? Well, you stand it a little bit and you'll realize that the functional relation is probably a straight line. And there is a little bit of noise, but every real world data has some sort of noise. Uh, doing this, uh, drawing this straight line is, is called linear regression. Now, imagine instead you have a set of points like this. Again, you did some experiment, maybe a oscilloscope or something. And well, that looks sort of periodic. Um, so maybe a good way to fit this would be to draw a cosine, some linear combination of sine and cosine through this set of points. Um, so when uh, the data looks like this, uh, there is clearly a nonlinear relation between y and x. And once you have a hint that there is a nonlinear relation, you need to decide what kind of nonlinear functions you're going to use to feed the nonlinear relation. Right? In this case, it was easy because the data is, uh, can be plotted on just on a plane. And you can look and see that maybe sines or cosines are a good idea. Uh, more generally, uh, if you don't know, or if data is more higher, it lives in higher dimension, you will have to uh, come up with a set of objects that are called feature maps in machine learning. These are uh, nonlinear functions by i that act on the data. Then you make linear combinations of these nonlinear functions. Uh, the parameters that you have in front of these functions are something you feed to the data. And if you chose the functions right, you can get a good fit. If you chose functions wrong, you will not get a good fit. For example, if you try to, to fit a quadratic x squared plus, I don't know, x to the four to this, you probably fail. But if you choose sines and cosines, you will succeed. So the common choices are polynomials, Gaussians, Fourier components. There's a lot of things you could do. We bound the range of the sum? Hmm? Like, yeah, so I did not, I did not bound. I, I specifically left it as I. In any sort of realistic application, you would choose a finite set of them. But uh, formally, we can also consider the case when the number of them goes to infinity, then we can switch language and we can still do machine learning reads. But what, what's good about some particular choice if the index can range to infinity, then you can use polynomials or Gaussians. They're yeah. both complete. Yeah, so uh, if we just do theory, writing equations, then whatever, as long as we have complete set, it's cool. But if you want to put them on the computer and find the values of W, then you cannot have too many because then you will run out of memory, the computation will be too hard. That's why I asked about the food bound Yeah. So in any practical case, there is a finite set that allows you to put them to this on the computer, but if we want to do theory, we can also allow ourselves to have anything. Yeah. yeah. So there's like this whole like thing of, if I have a function on a bounded interval, usually like Chebyshev approximation theory gives the optimal, like the least, number of terms necessary to approximate it correctly so is that something that's used a lot um so i don't know the, whether this chebyshev story is true in one dimension or in the arbitrary number of dimensions um, um now if it's in one dimension it really doesn't matter you can you can you, you can always think, you know you can always solve the problem on the other hand if it's in let's say hundred thousand dimensions then the situation is more complicated choosing the now you know choosing a complete set is not going to work because you the the number of elements in the complete set will grow exponentially with dimension. Okay, 
But these are the so this is this guys are going to be the main subject of the story. is about feature maps, and until 2012, mostly the feature maps were choosing by hand. You know something about the problem, you choose them, you hope that uh, given the choice, your model can do well. Now, in physics, uh, we usually have a luxury of having low dimensional data more often than not. I'm not sure about high energy experiment, but in, in everything that I ever did, the data is very low dimensional. And this feature function says to find by inspection by looking at the data. Uh, furthermore, um, in physics, we often have even more luxury of having a, some sort of theory that predicts us the functional form between the y and the x axis. In fact, this is how we verify a theory. If your theory predicts functional form, we fit parameters, we see the weather, whether we can fit well or not. Um, however, if the data lives in very high dimension, meaning the X is a vector with thousands or hundreds of thousands of components, we cannot then inspect data by hand or by eye because it's too high dimensional. So we cannot just easily guess this fine eye. Furthermore, if the data comes from real world, like real images, so mentioned cats, um, then there is no rule that tells us that cat is a cat. There's no set, finite set of rules which we can enlist, which is what people in 1965 failed to understand. Or maybe they did understand, but they didn't know how to solve. Now, here's an example that doesn't involve cats, but instead it's just the letter A, just to illustrate my point. Um, so in this case, every image, you can view it as a vector, every component of the vector is a pixel. And all of these are supposed to be versions of letter A. I think almost all of them are human understandable. And maybe if you're not burdened by knowledge of Greek alphabet, uh, Boolean algebra, or exterior products, you could also think, look at this and say that this is okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure what this is. <laughs> yeah. uh, but this, by the way, illustrates another interesting point that uh, extra information may hurt. If you know too much, uh, you, you, you may fail to recognize that the person who drew it is actually intended to be an A. So in this case, uh, dimension is number of pixels. It's, let's say, probably what, you know, close to 1,000. Uh, it is not hard uh, for us to recognize the letter, but I challenge anyone of you to write down the finite set of rules that if followed, we'll classify each one of these as a letter A. I'm worried slightly that if you are to write the set of rules, the number of rules you will list is going to be comparable to the number of examples. So let's try to formalize it just a little bit. I suppose we want to make a function such that given a vector x, meaning let's say a picture like this in the form of pixels, vectorized. Um, I'll put zero if X corresponds to letter A, uh, does not correspond to letter A, and I'll put one if X is under some definition of letter A is letter A. The function F only take value zero at one or could it be let's, 0 0.9? Well, let's say that function itself is continuous, but you know, it gets something very close to zero if it's not A and something close to one that uh, when it is A, and if you input garbage, it gives out garbage. Like if you answer letter B, it won't know it. It won't give zero. See? Should oh, sorry. Yeah, it's uh, it will give zero. Good, good point. So it's, it's kind of singular. It's, let's say it's kind of singular. Yeah. Um. So we could represent this function uh, as I uh, advertised before as linear combination of some nonlinear operations applied to the uh, to X. But uh, the question that I raised um, remains. So it's a thousand dimensional uh, set of vectors. The number of vectors, different vectors X is also exponentially large. You can imagine exponentially large uh, kinds of letter A. So what kind of phi should we use to ensure a good chance of success after we make some optimal choice of W? W is adjustable parameters. Uh, figuring out the finite number of phi is no different than writing down the finite set of rules, which is mathematic instead of in language. And again, this is until 2012, most was most common approach to understand the images. 
you take a list of features and you hope that you caught a lot enough about the world to recognize the images after this linear parameters I feel. And now what we could do, which I guess we just discussed both possibilities. So what Blaise suggested, just you know, take the full full basis, then you can fit anything. Uh, and this is true, but uh, it's not going to work in practice because we have too high dimension. Alternatively, we could handcraft a set of features, but that has a different problem. It actually has two problems. Problem number one is that once we spend a year doing this for letter A, we'll have to go to letter B and do it all over again. And then we'll have to go to letter C, and then we'll have to go through every letter in every alphabet in every language. And that's not going to work. Uh, alternatively, even if we did do this, there's always something that we haven't thought of. The life has fat tails. There's always something as far as a distribution, but it's still, uh, it still will be classified as letter A. So instead, the only approach that seems to work in practice is to learn this functions phi from the data instead of giving you choosing them by hand. That's what neural networks do. Uh, this was not possible in 1965 because there wasn't enough data to learn from in whatever task you could think of. Now, with internet, we have enough images, text, sound, video, whatever, to learn very, very good feature functions directly from the data. That's what's responsible for the success of deep learning. Okay, well, it's, uh, on the surface may seem easier said than done. So what, what does it mean to learn the feature functions? Well, uh, so what we're going to do in practice, we're going to say that uh, our function f is a linear combination of this linear parameters times the nonlinear operations applied to the data, and the nonlinear operation itself is parameterized by some other set of parameters. We will find both w and w prime so that uh, the, our function f does what we want it to do. Now, the way we do it in practice is we come up with some differentiable measure of how successful our function f is doing. This measure is called loss function. So the dumbest example would be just a square difference between the output of the function f on uh, the letter we give it uh, minus y, y is zero or one, the only two possible values we're interested our function to take. We square everything to ensure that that's positive definite. Mm -hmm. And we take a large number of x's to expose our function to as many different types of letter a as possible. And then we do minimization on all of the parameters w. Now, if uh, this phi is some arbitrary function of w prime, and the number of this w prime is counted in millions, then doing optimization is really hard because you'll have to take millions of derivatives, assuming you're going to do gradient descent. You're going to take millions of derivatives, billions of times. And if you don't have a, a nice trick to take derivatives fast, then this will never work. So, it is at this point to be able to take derivatives fast where neural networks come in. Now, a neural network is just a particular way to represent these feature functions. It's nothing more. Uh, and the way um, you set it up is you represent these feature functions not as some maybe uh, some over complete basis with parameters that you choose, but you represent this feature function as a, composi as, as a composition of many operations. And the way you do it is first, uh, you use some linear operation that introduces parameters to be optimized. So in this case, I just take my letter A and I contract it with some matrix. Uh, then once you did this, you introduce a nonlinear operation, which just applies a nonlinear function called the activation function element by element. And the choice of nonlinear activation function is something that one has to do by hand. There is no principle of nature that says which one to choose. Uh, and then you keep repeating these two steps for as long as you like. Now, the reason it's set up this way is because when you compute derivative with respect to any of the parameters, you use chain rule. And the nice thing about chain rule is in order to compute derivative with respect to next set of parameters, all you need to know is derivative with respect to previous set of parameters. So you can recursively calculate all of the derivatives. And that's what allows to uh, optimize uh, networks with billions, hundreds of billions of parameters. You reduce the problem of calculating 
derivatives to multiplication. As long as you can do multiplication, you can do really well. Uh, for this talk, uh, where they're doing this is called back propagation. And that's uh, as far as ML is concerned, probably the main discovery of the 20th century. Although it's not a uh, conceptually complicated thing. So, so, the so I, was, I, yeah. I didn't start well what activation means here. What, what it's just a word. Uh -huh. So I I calculate the senior combination. Right. I get a vector of uh, numbers. And then to each one of these numbers, I apply a function. This function is called activation. That's something like right. distribution function. Okay. Any, act, yeah. any non linear function yeah. I want. And yeah. Then. yeah, so I will. I can give a couple of examples if you like. Um, hyperbolic tanch is very popular. Another one that's popular is called uh, uh, rectified linear union. It's, it looks something like this. Um, in the talk, I will actually describe a quadratic activation function, which just squares the number. For some problems, that's sufficient. And there is no principle really that allows you to choose one. Some one of the principles you can use is whatever you can calculate the fastest, that's the one that you can use. Or for which you, for which the derivative you can calculate the fastest, that's the one you can use. Is it important that uh, the set of functions that I can make iteratively this way for large enough capital N becomes complete? Yeah, it is um, hard to say how important it is. Uh, this is called, this has a name which escapes me right now. Um, there is a theorem that says that if you just will have one hidden layer, so if there is no dot, 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 if, it, if the if network is just this, given wide enough network, you're going to present a risk function. But the problem is that theorem is entirely useless because it's existence theorem. It says that you can do it, doesn't tell you how. And it seems that um, if you add this dot, 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 so if you make the network zip, not just wide, that helps to find a good one. But um, as far as I know, uh, there is no understanding of what is responsible for finding better and better functions as far as choice of architecture is concerned. Is there, is there any sort of analysis of uh, sort of optimization times uh, on tested on different types of non-linearities? Big different there are choices of hundreds, if not thousands. Oh, okay. they, as far as I can tell, they average to zero. Oh, I see. Okay. So it doesn't seem to make much of a difference. Then. Uh, the way the field works is that at some point, somebody finds something that works and everyone else does that. Uh, there is no, uh, there's no attempt to find best phi. I, I think in part because best phi depends on many other choices you made. Depends on maybe data. Depends on other right. um, on other parts of this uh, very complicated linearly coupled puzzle. Right. And the file you choose is always the same at every step. You don't change. You don't have to. But you could. You could choose different. You could choose the same. It's more often than not that people do choose the same, but there is no again principle of organization that tells you that you have to. In fact, what sometimes people try doing but failed in the end is to look. So it's to learn the fine. To parameterize not just this, but also the function itself with a few extra parameters and learn this uh, by doing optimization as well. That didn't really uh, lead to anything interesting as far as I know, but you could also do that. Um, okay. So when, when formulas like this are written, pictures like this are drawn, for, for my purposes, pictures like this are not, going, are not going to be useful because I'll consider the simplest possible network like this, and the, um, the, the formulas will be better. But in case you saw the pictures, but no, so the formulas, that's uh, this picture means uh, this, uh, this set of equations. The middle layer is all the repeat of the repetitions that you made. Like if you made yes. many repetitions. Yeah. Is there something that tells you when you stop, when not you stop, how many times you should do Whatever it? works, that's the only criteria that currently is understood by the community. And usually how many layers? Yeah, I'm, I'm about to show. Um, 
Yeah, is there a measure of sophistication of the network for fixed time in terms of number of the depth of the network? So can you repeat again? Is there some measure of that you can assign that measures sophistication of the network? Like the ability to, you know, how, how? There, there is a word that measures sophistication of the network that's called expressivity. There is a, okay. there are many definitions of this, what this word means, and I'm not aware of any consequence of these definitions on the practice. <laughs> it's a little bit of disconnect between theory and experiment. Um, I will uh, address the depth question in a moment because I'll have a few examples of the modern day networks, just Victoria and Sean. Um, so, but first I want to show you uh, what feature maps look like uh, for this baby example of a single hidden layer network with a single uh, nonlinearity. So uh, that's the formula for the network as I showed you before. And I'll just compare that. So uh, index K is a vector index, index Q is a vector index, the output is a vector function. Um, and uh, if you remember, uh, before I wrote W times phi, so phi is just Z, so explicitly the feature maps are given by this formula. It's some nonlinear function applied to matrix contracted with the X. That's all. And once we keep choosing, keep changing W, we will keep changing phi. We'll find the best W one that fits the data. And I, I will, if I ever get to that point, I'll have an explicit formula for, for this W for a particular task. Um, Okay, so I have the general comments here, which I actually forgot what I wrote, so I'll just read them. Learning features from the data is the central reason why deep learning works. So this I emphasized before, and I cannot emphasize this enough. This is the only reason why, why, why there is progress. Now, the process of learning features is very nonlinear. It has a lot of noise, and it's not really clear what it means that you have learned features other than your network is doing well in the task you're trying to solve. It's very hard to look at this set of W's and say, oh, something was learned. Now, deep neural networks don't just learn features. If they're deep, they learn a hierarchy of features because at every layer, there are some, some functions. There is, as far as I can tell, there is zero understanding of this hierarchy. It's not clear in what language of what part of science one should be using to discuss this hierarchy. But what one can see empirically is that the different layers they concentrate on different kinds of information as far as let's say images are concerned. But that's really the extent of it. Can you give us a more specific example in the images, what you mean by that? That the different kinds of features. So for example, in the earlier layers, they seem to detect edges and the overall shapes. Whereas in uh, much, much deeper layers, they seem to concentrate on something more detailed. Like it can distinguish textures, let's say, fur from something plain or it can distinguish nose from an eye or face from, I don't know, from a clock, things like this. But uh, the frustrating thing to anybody who ever did quantitative science is that that's the kind of explanation that makes you angry, not uh, you know, what, what, wanting to do something more quantitative because it's not really, a, it's, not, it's not, I don't know, it's a, that doesn't qualify as an explanation as far as I could say. Now, what's interesting to me is that um, these learned features, they are, by any definition of the word emergent, are emergent. Meaning that um, these are the functions that come out from interaction of very large number of microscopic variables. The microscopic variables being the weights, right? They're not built in by hand. We did something to the weights that's not human interpretable. And then we find features. And sometimes features, as an example I just gave, can be human interpretable. Um, this, How do you I, tell in practice that an early layer concentrates on a given feature? So this is a good question. Um, the way it's done in practice is by something that's called saliency maps. And what's done is that you take a very particular feature you ask what kind of inputs maximize its value. When does it turn on and when does it turn off? And then you just generate images that turn it on as hard as possible. So if let's say a feature is turned on by an eye, there will be like large number of eyes or one big eye. 
if the feature is uh, turned on by an edge, all of the picture will just have edges and so on. I can uh, show you a site where you don't have to do this anything by hand. You just can click and it will show you all kinds of things that maximize particular features. Now, uh, what I find the most exciting about this is that when I used to do when I used to do spend more time doing CMT, you would always think that oh, if only there was just a better experiment, if only like our experimenters could, could measure a little bit more, we can do better theory. Right? Here is an example um, where there's absolutely no excuse to not be able to predict something. You know every value of every microscopic variable at every moment of time, and you know the rate of the change of this microscopic variable at every moment of time. You know everything. And you cannot predict anything. If we cannot do this, you probably should maybe hold off with nature of the universe. Seems a much, much simpler problem. We still cannot do it. But is there any hint that there's something like universality here, something simple to explain? Yeah, there are there are there are hints. What are those hints? Um so one of the hints is that if you take the neural network and you, you, you kind of mess details a little bit, you initialize it differently, you give a slightly different data, you perhaps modify architecture a little bit, change microscopics a little bit. It still performs just as well. It finds similar features. This would be one example. Another example is that if you take a class of architectures and start either giving them more and more data or fix the amount of data and start increasing their size, the, their performance <clears throat> follows a power law with a very fixed exponent, it's called scaling laws. And um, if you change architecture or data by a lot, then exponent changes. If you don't, then exponents re remains simpler. Uh, there are other examples, but in every case, you have to design a set of experiments that show that there is a reproducible robust behavior that needs to be understood. So in this, uh, again, if I ever make it to scientific part of the talk, I will show you an example that is very, very, very simple and you can just really get your hands dirty with it. But short answer to your question is yes, I think that, that there, I don't believe that learning is just complete chaos. Um, now, the theoretical approach that was popular last couple of years, started by physicists, both from high energy and condensed matter, um, is to make a mean field approximation to neural networks. So mean field approximation is an approximation where you take the neural network and make it very, very wide. It's sort of like going into infinite dimension with a spin model. And when you do this, um, the network function becomes just a Gaussian free field. It is sampled from the Euclidean action that is quadratic in the network function. And all of the action is determined by the kernel. The action is non local. X and X prime are data points. And uh, the form of this kernel depends on the architecture, but it doesn't depend on the data. So once you know the architecture, you can calculate this K. And uh, you can do predictions without ever training the network. This tells you how likely it is to get a particular F. That they do. Yes, this thing, so this, this describes ensemble of neural networks. And uh, given this K, you can write a formula of how to predict uh, the label of variable X. K, Brown's tree or set of functions. What is this variable? I beg your pardon? What is K here? So the simplest example of K is this. You take um, the featured maps that I described to you before, and you just make a correlation matrix out of these feature maps. What are you averaging over? So this would be functional integral over F. It's described an ensemble of the network functions. Of the final result or over some interior details? You're just averaging over the final result? Surely, surely you must have, you want to predict F, right? Yeah. So this is the curious point. Um, at initialization, neural network function, of course, is going to generate only garbage because it doesn't know anything about the data. 
However, uh, if you take this mean field approximation first and then train the network function, then in the end, it will remain Gaussian. And there is an explicit formula for this k. Uh, but this explicit formula only depends on the things you can calculate at initialization before you train. So it's, yes, this is a dumb question. So e to the minus s would be the ansatz for the probability distribution for oh, yes. functions s. Yes. Ah, okay. Sorry, another one. What is the where is Q running from? The small Q. So Q is the so the f is a vector function. All right. So whatever the output is, let's say number of classes, U goes from between one and the number of classes. Ten for n, just median for image net, and so on. Okay. Um, a slightly later work, more by high energy people. Um, then show uh, showed that oh I forgot to say important thing here in this limit although things can be calculated and even phrased in the language that's more familiar and pleasant to us um, there is no feature learning everything that k this kernel depends on is calculated at initialization before any learning has happened so it's uh, ultimately equivalent to taking a particular set of features, how we determine it depends on the network architecture, but in the end, just particular set of features and uh, making linear regression as I described before. Uh, this is not meant to be understandable from a single summary slide, just trust me. Um, the later work tried to remedy this issue if you do believe that deep learning is about learning features, then mean field uh, is, is clearly not enough to understand it. And it turns out that uh, to this mean field, there are corrections that go as depth over width under some definition of the word depth. And in uh, these corrections are, although calculable, are horrendous, horrendously difficult to calculate. And for any realistic network, um, they're not really calculable. So, but I want to emphasize here is that in physics, we often just, you know, take the mean field state and maybe some fluctuations around mean field if they're not too bad, just modify things qualitatively, but uh, don't change any, any physics. For deep learning situation is reverse. It is the corrections that are responsible for its success. It's all about being away from mean field, not being at the mean field. There is of course a question that whether networks used in practice are in this regime where they're almost mean field plus corrections, or they are very, very far away from it. And to the best of my knowledge, there is no detailed study of it because it's kind of awkward question to ask and to answer. Uh, if I had to give my guess, I, I would guess they're not anywhere close to this Gaussian regime. Though I think every author listed will violently disagree. Um, Okay, so let me just uh, show you a couple of architectures that they used in practice also to answer the depth question. Um, well, so this is an example of the architectures from a few years ago that were, that were doing image recognition. They are absurdly deep. Um, each one of these blocks is a linear operation coupled with an application of nonlinearity. And these arrows are something like a next to the nearest neighbor hopping. They also mix outputs of different layers between each other. So analyzing this in, in mean field is, uh, if you have a graduate student, you really hate that's okay. uh, task. Now, this is a more, uh, more, more recent architectures, they're both transformers. Uh, they seem a little bit uh, less intimidating than that, but unfortunately their complexity is hidden in the separation called attention. And uh, they, are, they are more difficult to analyze than these. Incidentally, you asked me a question about depth. So th these, these are examples with 34 layers. How many parameters order of magnitude is it? These are hundreds, uh, these, these are uh, tens of hundreds of millions. How many images are they trained on? Wait, kind of That's a very, that's, that, that, that's the, I would swear, I would swear. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. Um, so finally, uh, this is the alpha pool that became famous maybe a year ago. There are 48 
layers or blocks. Each, each block has many layers inside. Um, so what I would like to have is the model of feature learning where we can really understand what's happening. And there are a lot of obstacles to having a model like XYZ arising. There are a lot of obstacles to having such a model because the real world data is very messy. It's unlikely that you can use real world data to have a solvable, analytically understandable model. Most common uh, toy model of machine learning is called teacher student model, which is uh, anybody who went to college probably had this idea at some point which is you use one network to model the outputs, model the data, and then use another network to learn the parameters of the first network. This is, uh, well, um, is doable, is usually done by people because it's easier, not because it is hard, or not because it's useful. And optimization itself is a nonlinear stochastic process. So uh, if you try to understand analytically optimization, you're trying to solve a Nonlinear system of different equations with noise for millions of variables. That's that's not something we can do. Uh, so what we'll try to do, what I have tried to do is um, to take the data that's understandable by human, uh, not not necessarily coming from real world, but complex enough to learn to necessi necessitate learning features, network architecture that's simple enough uh, to solve, but complex enough to exhibit feature learning. So no common approximations of linearity and dynamics that has a, uh, no noise, but still yields yield to feature loss. Uh, so now a side where I also answer will, will answer a place question about number of parameters and number of uh, uh, data points. So, but before that, I just want to fix the language uh, whenever. So I, I will only talk about supervised learning. Supervised learning means your data set consists of pairs. X are the inputs, let's say images, and Ys are the desired outputs, let's say a language description of what's on the image. Usually you take the data set and separate it into train and test, such that the entire data set is the union and the train and test sets don't overlap. The reason you do this is because you do the optimization only on the train data set, only on the train set, and then you check how well your function is doing on examples your network never saw, so on the test set. And at this point, a uh, reasonable question I ask is, so how many are parameters are there and how many data points are there? But there's a word that answers this question, which is uh, over parameterization. In all practical cases of, um, of use, networks function in the regime where the number of parameters is much larger than the number of data points, which is, if you only saw physics until now, sounds like utter heresy. But it is an empirical fact that if you are in this regime, the network that you learn does not overfit and performs well on data it have never seen. Now, it's a, as far as I can tell, it's a sharp counterexample to the joke that was propagated by von Neumann and Fermi regarding uh, being able to feed elephant with four parameters and making a twiggless trunk with pi. So this is a, the elephant known as Van Neumann Fermi elephant. To, to feed that one, you need four complex parameters. And there is indeed a fifth parameter that allows it to move its trunk. I didn't make a movie, but uh, there's a Wikipedia page for it. And there are four notes you can follow. Yeah. Is there a sense of making the testing data sort of far outside the regime of the of the initial data. I mean, I can imagine that if you make an interpolating function with some number of parameters, and then you ask for the value in the middle, mm -hmm. you might get a good answer. Yeah. But but somehow like extra like extrapolating beyond that. Is, right. there, is there a way of so this about that? yeah so this is uh, where um, our low dimensional intuition kind of fails because all these feeds are in hundreds of thousands of dimensions. And almost every question that you ask, every sort of different image, is an extrapolation. It's never between a third cat is never in any sense between two other cats, unless you really fine tune it to be. So the question of uh, how to go far outside of distribution is one of the sort of super active areas of research. What it really means to go outside. It seems that. All of the image data sets out there are roughly the same. 
to how all natural images seem to be roughly the same. So like you, you could do something, you test your data on all real cats, pictures of real cats, and then you test it on pictures of like cartoon and cats. And cats, yeah. So, so this, this is, yeah, so this would be a good example of human interpretable out of distribution. And if you have never seen a single example of a cartoon cat, you will do worse than if you did. But you also will not do poorly. Now, my answer to Van Neumann and Fermi would be that you cannot fit, you, you, you perhaps can't fit a single elephant with, um, with more parameters, but to fit all of the elephants, you need a lot of parameters. Almost certainly much more than there are elephants. This indicates to me that the true degrees of freedom are not the microscopic individual parameters, but instead there are emergent collective variables which we do not know how to count. So here is uh, coming back to this state of the art example I showed before. This is ImageNet. There is 900 million parameters in the network. And so this is, this is the exact number of parameters, 893 8, million. And there are only 14 million images. So it's very over-parameterized. Uh, you can calculate number of parameters per image, but I'm not sure what it tells you. I do not think it says that there are 64 uh, numbers that characterize every image. Eight by eight. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah. Um, you can also calculate the number of parameters you need to identify a single class. So let's say all, all the images of elephants require 900,000 parameters. And I Googled, there are only five, 450,000 elephants out there. <laughs> how many, like, how many Y variables are there in this? This is the one, uh, Yeah, so uh, there is 1 million classes. 1 million classes. So the Y vector is 1 million dimensional. And that's how I got 900,000 parameters. Uh -huh. I divided them. Doing this basic math on the field makes me feel like a real scientist. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> thank you for your attention. <laughs> how much time do I have? So, how many slides? Do you have? Oh, I'm exactly in the middle. In the middle? Yeah. But I can skip things about the, the uh, another box. Yeah, more. Are you around for a while? It's around for two weeks. Oh, well, why so, don't we just stop here and then you talk again? Yeah. I think you can try to schedule one. Not to you. Yeah. That's probably easier for people because I, I won't be able to stay for, say, another hour. I did not intend to ask that. Okay. How long would it take you to ask? He said that, that he's in the middle. No, no, I, I understood, but if you skip uh, in a sense, Maybe we can summarize. I can, I can summarize if you like. And, and, then, and then you'll yeah, talk. And then you can give another talk. Maybe yeah, can you can summarize. If it's interesting enough, we can do another talk again. Yeah, start and exactly. no Please. So, the problem uh, I was going to show you how to solve using neural networks is the problem of modular addition, which is um, the first time I heard about it, I, without exaggeration, did not believe that it was possible. So, here's an example just a table of modular addition, mod seven. You, you all know what it means, I hope. Um, we are going to set up as, set this up as a supervised learning problem, meaning I give the network the table with a bunch of the entries blocked out and ask to predict which ones are missing. That's all, that's the problem. Um, now to me at the time, and still does, looks more like continuous, continuous sequence problem. And continuous sequence problem is unsolvable because it's just stupid. There are infinite number of ways to continue any sequence. Nonetheless, um, if you do modular addition with the base starting from around 50 or more, you need about 10% of the table to predict the remaining 90. P is what? P is it's the, the base. The base. Yes, this is, this is P equals seven. Mm -hmm. But if the base is high enough, then you can just do it. Or you, or not you rather, but the net. But there's also infinitely many patterns that you might be talking about with only this 10% of the data. So exactly. what does that mean that you, you trick it most of the time? Like what if we were talking about a, a more complicated pattern that isn't, yeah. it has the same 10% of cases, but. So I actually have not, was not able to find a good example of this. 
If you just, let's say, uh, keep this and fill the remaining blocks, the black blocks, with random numbers, which is example of perfectly fine sequence, of course it will fail on this, but it will naturally flow towards continuing this sequence as modular addition mod p. And this is example of universality. You change architecture, it does it. You change optimization method, it still does it. You add more noise, it still does it. You cannot get rid of the effect, it just does it. It doesn't have to be modular addition, by the way, it can be some other function over ZP. It could be sum of squares, could be product, could be more complicated, we do not know. It still does it. How does the percentage change with P? Good question. The higher P is, the less fraction of the table you need to do better, to do to, do, to get 100%. Now, the way it does it is also quite mysterious and looks like a picture from physics, which is um, it does it very suddenly, hence the word grokking. So that's the effect that was called grokking. Um, what happens is that you take this 10% of the table and then you train on it. And the training accuracy goes to 100% very fast. This is not surprising because the number of parameters is much bigger than the number of data points. So you, fit in, you can fit anything instantly. And that's what happens. But then you keep training and keep looking what happens to the elements of the table you have not seen or the network have not seen. And you keep doing it for a lot of steps and nothing seems to happen until a certain magical step, network suddenly realizes the pattern and goes to 100% less accuracy. That's the effect that was called, that's called broken that was discovered purely empirically in this, this paper year. That's a small question. Is the training loss staying constant or is it still going up slightly? It's hard to see. So this is loss. So you are, so that picture was oh, about okay. accuracy. Accuracy is kept at 100%. You cannot do better than 100%. Okay, but the loss. But you can also introduce loss, yeah. which is a continuous measure of how well you're doing. And training loss keeps decreasing the entire time, whereas test loss first goes up and then goes down. At some point, it does worse than random guessing. When something happens, it goes down. So that's, um, that's the effect. And uh, there are many different examples they try to do, many different functions they try to hit. The effect doesn't go away. So that's an example of universality that play asked about. Um, so, and this is where I'll just uh, give the two minute overview of what I was going to talk about. I was going to say that I found the simplest possible place. I could, that by simplest possible, I mean I could not make it more simple, where this effect still persists, which is the network function being quadratic and parameter, quadratic and in inputs and cubic and in parameters. This is one hidden layer activation function is quadratic. So the entire network function can be very nicely written like this. These pictures are made for that network function for modular addition. And this network function turns out to be so simple. And the modular addition task turns out to be so simple that you can um, write an explicit formula for the weights. Just write the formula, plug it into the network function, and it gives you 100% accuracy. Now, examples of this kind of thing did exist before, but as far as I can tell, uh, they are never found by the optimizer, which is a question about representability. Um, you can argue that function exists, but the gradient descent may not be able to find. In this case, it does. And uh, I have some empirical ways of showing that the uh, solution found by gradient descent is very, very close to, to these weights. This is just the list formulas for the weights. Um, this you can argue this analytically. The only conceptual step that's required to prove this is the fact that sum of random phases is zero. Um, and then I was going to just show stuff about about this model various properties but each one of them uh, will take some time to explain uh, maybe the last fun fact is that some some functions over zp which don't look any different from any other functions cannot be learned no matter what you do for example this cubic function doesn't look any different than the function on the left except that it has three at one point one place uh, no matter what you do it you never get best accuracy above zero, even if you use 99% of the data to train. 
as one of the mysteries. Um, these are comments that only would make sense if I told you the rest of the talk. So I, I'll, I'll still leave that. Maybe I'll, I'll just leave that. Give this. Yeah, so that's the overview was uh, what the scientific part of the talk was going to be about. Perhaps entertaining part was better. Yeah, that may be. Any questions? All right, just in the end, you said there were some functions it couldn't learn. For those functions, do you have? An exact solution is that like for some of them, yeah. So I have a class of functions for which I have an exact solution, which is a um, class of functions like this. It's a you, you take a function and you apply a function to some of function of the first variable and possibly different function of the second variable. So whatever is representable this way, I have an analytic solution, which is these formulas. And for other things, for example, n times m, I don't have an analytic solution, but the optimizer can still solve it. And then the, the functions I showed you in the last slide, for them, I neither have an analytic solution, but neither can the optimizer. But you don't have an example where you have an analytic solution. And, and it cannot solve it? Yeah. I do not have such example. No. It, it seems like it's... The fact that even I can do it means that optimizer definitely can do it. <laughs> <laughs> so if you consider something that's like very complicated, like it's like a binary with if it's prime to output one, if it's not a prime to output zero. And if you try to train on some like where we know that like complexity theory says interesting things about the model or function, have you tried functions of those ones? Uh, that's a good question. I don't. I don't know what uh, complexity theory says about m cubed plus m, m squared plus m, but uh, something more complicated as you described. I suspect there are no miracles, meaning that it will not give you all possible primes after seeing the first few thousand. If that maybe if that was the question, if I understood the question correctly. Um, if you treat the accuracy as an order parameter, you do some nice functionality class. Well, so that, that that's sort of the um, initial resp initial uh, desire of any physicist to do to look at the picture like this and to say, well, that looks like zero and one, and and maybe there is a phase transition in between, but I don't know how to. Um, how to make this rigorous. It, it, it's look, it looks like a transition. It looks like accuracy should be on the parameter, but I, uh, I don't know how to, how, how to make it. Uh, is, there, is there any sort of scaling behavior, for example, with the uh, width of the layer or? Yeah, so that, that's this plot. Ah, uh, I see. Uh, the accuracy, uh, once I scale the width, the accuracy of both solution found by optimizer and the analytic solution, once width is big enough, saturates to 100 and then remains the 100. But uh, if the network is too small, then you can get close to 100, but not exactly 100. So th there is some scaling question you can ask with this mm -hmm. solvable model too. Okay. Uh, so, so basically, it seems to me that when you build like this, the neural network, what you are basically doing is constructing a very complex nonlinear function with many parameters, right? And then you, you do back propagation to train it. Uh, how worst I would do of instead of you doing this procedure to construct this nonlinear function, if I just have like a linear combination of like a, uh, x to some power with like coefficients uh, which, which I'm tra training so so basically like uh, yeah I truncate and I put like uh, because it seems like uh, more clean in a way but and and I don't see why I mean of course it's a very simple a way simpler nonlinear function but uh, so the the problem is the dimension of the data 
in the, the let's say dimension of the data is hundred thousand, right? You will have to choose a bunch of these polynomials per dimension. So let's say ten per dimension, ten to the five hundred thousand. So ten to the hundred thousand. That's not. That's not. That's just not going to work. You can choose very little, but then you won't fit well. Also, there was the practical problem that you explained about computing the derivatives to do the fitting. Yeah. The, the iterative composition solves. Yeah. Then, yeah, you will have a very, very large number of parameters. Just typing them in is a problem, computing derivatives problem. Let's thank Andre. Very welcome. I love to be in, but you're around, right? For two weeks. Please. Yeah. Okay.